Hey, Pratt and Wesleyan Church and everyone joining with us online today. My name is Shane, and I just want to welcome you to PWC Online and say that we're so glad that you're here with us today. While you're here with us or this morning or wherever you access this, we want to encourage you not to just watch the elements of this worship experience. We want you to sing along and worship along with us. We want you to pray along with us. And we want you to join in the conversation in the comments below. If you have a prayer request that you would like our prayer team to be praying for this week, please leave it in the comments or feel free to inbox us or email us. If you're joining us for the first time today and would like more information about who we are and how we can be more involved, you can be more involved at Prattville Wesleyan Church, please head to our website and reach out with any questions you may have. Also, if you would like more info about how you can be part of a virtual small group here at PWC, just text PWC Groups to 66866 and follow the instructions. Remember that you can join with us every Sunday morning for worship at 1045 on Facebook, YouTube, or on our website. I encourage you to take some time this week and invite someone to join with you. Once again, we welcome you to Prabhu Wesleyan Church Online, and I'm so glad you're here with us. Wherever you are this morning, if you can, I encourage you to stand and sing along with us.
light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see the beauty that made this heart adore you. Hope of a life spent with you. Here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. Oh, so highly exalted, glorious in heaven above. Humbly you came to the earth you created, all for our sake became poor. So here I am to worship, here I am. Thank you. 
Well, welcome once again to PwC Online. Uh, we're so glad that you are here with us today. Now, before we jump into our series, before we jump into the finale of my story, and if you've missed any of these Sundays, please make sure you go and check out any Sundays that you missed online. Uh, before we jump in, before we wrap this up, I want to give everybody a, a quick update about our regathering strategy. And we want to call it a regathering strategy because the reality is, is that it's not reopening. We were never closed. We were just church online for a couple of months. And so we don't want to confuse anybody. We are going to begin regathering, not reopening. And so after listening to and, and talking with our district leaders and, and local and state and federal leaders, we have set a target date of June the 7th. That is one week from today, June 7th being our first Sunday of regathering in our facility. So we recognize still that any number of things could change even in a week's time. And if that does happen, we will let you know. But our goal, our plan is to be here one week from today. Now, what we need you to understand is this, is that everything will be a little different because we are going to be following the guidelines set forward by different organizations. And that means that we're going to be maintaining social distancing in our building at all times. It means that we are going to kind of enter in one family at a time and, and we're going to have no PwC kids ministry. We're going to have no cafe, so no coffee and donuts and the things that we normally have. And if you've experienced any symptoms or have been around anyone that tested positive for, for COVID-19, we ask that you not enter the building. And so that things are going to look a little bit different in which you may say, wow, you know, I, I'm not so sure that it, it kind of feels like maybe we're, we're doing this a little too fast and I would still be safer at home. Well, listen, this is really, really important. If you feel like at this moment that it is safer for you and your family to continue to worship with us at home, we fully support you and we strongly encourage you to do that. We are going to continue to be church online even after we start regathering. We're going to continue to, to have all of our worship times, all of our worship experiences on our Facebook page live. It'll be uploaded to our YouTube and our website. Uh, so all of our content, all of our information, everything that we do will still continue to be online. And so if you feel like right now it's just safer and, and you would feel more comfortable being at home, we encourage you to do that. And, and if, you, if you are a person that is in one of the at-risk, the high-risk categories, we strongly encourage you to stay home and continue to connect with us online until you feel like it's safer to do so. If you are a family with young kids and you've got a two-year-old and a four-year-old and you're thinking, so no PwC kids, and you expect me just to come and, and sit in a room with my kids and, and they're going to be going crazy and you, you are already stressed out at that possibility, hey, it's okay. We encourage you to continue to, to join us online and you can do that on your couch in your pajamas with your kids running around crazy everywhere at your house, and that's okay. And if you just feel like, you know what, it's it's just a little bit early for me, I'm not sure I trust gathering in, in social places just yet, that's okay, we fully support you. You stay at home and can connect with us online until you feel like we are ready, you are ready, and it is safer for you. But our goal is one week from today. Now, if you have any questions about this, that you would like for us to be able to answer. Please feel free, reach out to us, email us, and we will make sure that we get that information to you. And just a reminder that whether you begin regathering with us next week or, or you're going to continue to have PwC online as your, your church for the foreseeable future, we want to encourage you to stay all in here at PwC. All in. And there are four ways that we've been encouraging you to do that. The first is to stay engaged. To stay engaged. That means to continue to connect with us through our worship services online and, and gather with us for prayer at 830 on Wednesday evenings on Facebook and YouTube. And, and, and gather with us and connect with us all week through our social media. And I want to, to let you guys know something really, really exciting that's going to be happening. Because even when we begin regathering, we're not going to be doing small groups in the facility. It's hard to, to social distance those things for, for at least the immediate future. We're not going to be having those in our facility. But we are going to be launching some virtual small groups. And so here's what I want you to do right now. Make sure you're paying attention to this. If you have any interest at all 
in connecting in a virtual small group here at PwC, I want you to do this. I want you to text the word PwC groups, all lowercase, all one word, PwC groups to the number 66866. PwC groups to 66866. Now we're gonna be meeting via Zoom in some of these groups. And so it's just an opportunity for you to be able to connect with people, even if you're not in the room with them. And so if you would like any information at all, even just the slightest bit of interest in this, all you gotta do is text PwC groups to 66866 and we will get you uh, some information about what those groups are gonna look like and when they're gonna get started. So connect, stay connected with us. Second way to stay all in is to encourage, to love the people around you. And there are several ways you can do that uh, in your community, in your neighborhood. And if you're looking for ways to do that, uh, we are still taking food every Monday morning over to the COVID-19 clinic. And so you have the opportunity to, to love your, your people who are here on the front lines every single week. If you would like more information about how you can be involved directly in doing that, please reach out and let us know. Every Thursday, we are taking food to the hospital workers, individually wrapped snacks and drinks. And all you gotta do to be involved in that is whenever you are at the store, don't make the special trip, but whenever you're at the store, pick up an extra pack of, uh, of individually wrapped crackers or cookies and, or drinks and, and just drop them off here at the church. Every single day we bring them in, but there's this red basket sitting out on the porch here at the church. Just put it in there. We bring it in and every Thursday we load it up and we take it over there. Just a great way to love and support people here in our community. The third way to stay all in is to invite, continue to invite people to join you here at PwC. And the fourth way is to stay invested invested here at PwC with your tithes and offerings. And there are several ways to do that. Number one, you can drop off your tithe check here. Number two, you can mail, as long as the mail is running, we'll be checking it. And number three, you can go to our website, prattvillewesleyan.com, and you can make your secure donation right there. So stay all in during this season. So now before we jump into our series, I want us to take some time uh, in prayer. And I want us to be praying for our community, for our, for our state, for our world, for our country. Uh, there's still so many people hurting and suffering uh, because of this uh, virus and, and beyond. We just want to pray that God would continue to heal and bring mercy and grace to our land. And we want to pray for our church, for our community. We want to pray for each other. If you have any special prayer requests that you would like us to be praying for, that you would like everybody to be praying for, you can do a couple things. Number one, you can put it in the comments below uh, so that we can all be praying for each other. Or number two, if it's a little more private and you just want our prayer team to be praying for it, you can send us an inbox or an email and let us know what that prayer request is. But we want to be praying. So right where you are, if you would, would you just bow your heads and join me in prayer this morning? Father, first of all, we thank you for the opportunity to get to gather today just online. It's, it's incredible that we can continue to, to worship you, to pray, and to, to be together even when we haven't started regathering yet. God, we're grateful. And so, Father, I pray that today, first and foremost, that you would bring healing to those who need healing. We recognize that, that this pandemic, that this a virus is, is not over and, and that there are a lot of people who are still sick and hurting and we want to pray, God, for your, your healing and your mercy in their lives. Father, we want to pray for quick recovery. God, we want to pray for those who are and have been affected financially by this. We don't want to minimize the effects that this can have in a person's life. We pray that you would give them your wisdom and guidance as they move forward. God, we pray for those who are on the front lines, who are working day after day with people who are contracting the disease and, and, and who are sick. And, and we just want you to give them a supernatural strength to continue to be able to do what they do for us. God, we pray for those who are mourning the loss of a loved one. We pray for comfort that only you can provide. And God, for those who are, who are sick and hurting across our our city, our state, our country, our world. We just pray that you would bring your healing in. And Father, we pray for our church. We pray that you would, God, that 
you would continue to use us. We've been praying for, during this series, a thousand stories of hope and grace to be written through what you do here at PwC and beyond, in this community and beyond. And we believe that you can do that. We believe that you are a God that still does miracles, that you're a God that still transforms lives. And we ask that you would do that right now. And Father, in the, in the few minutes that we have left together today, I, I pray that you would speak to us through your word, through your story, that you would help us to be able to, to really, really focus our, our hearts and our soul's attention on you for what you have for us through your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. So during this series, My Story, we've been hearing a lot of different stories from people, and uh, it's been exciting. I hope that you've learned some things and that maybe you've seen uh, how God has written a story of hope and grace and transformation in your life. Well, today I'm excited to share this story with you. It's, uh, you know, we have been here at PwC, I have as the pastor, for uh, almost 10 months, around 10 months now. Uh, but it feels like a little less than that because we've been doing church online for the last several months. But, but you guys, uh, you, you've got to hear from me a lot. But one person that you probably haven't heard from or don't know as much about is my wife, Jessica. And so Jessica is going to share her story with you today about what God has done in her life. So check out Jessica's story. If I told you my story. Hi, my name is Jess Woods, and this is a little bit of my story. Hmm. I would say that my favorite food depends largely on my mood. Now, I do have a few go-tos um, that are pretty consistent. Things like toast and scrambled eggs, um, a really good baked potato and salad, Mexican food, and brownies. Not all together, but those are definitely my go-tos. I have a lot of favorite things about living in Alabama. I grew up in the South, so being back in the South is a breath of fresh air. We've just come before this from six years in New York where things were cold and gray. Um, actually ran the car into the garage once because um, I saw a bird on our bushes and it had been a long time since I'd seen a bird. So. Uh, you know, being back in the South with sunshine and birds and all the insects and blooming things has been very nice for me. It's good for my soul. My early church experience is probably one that's pretty familiar to many people. I grew up in church. My grandfather was a pastor and my father was a pastor. So I was in church pretty much anytime the doors open and even when they weren't open because obviously my parents were doing a lot behind the scenes as well. But at some point, your faith does have to become your own. And um, for me, that started about the time that I was 14. I had been at a youth conference where they were talking about various um, mission trips um, overseas. So I remember going to my parents and saying, can I go to Costa Rica? And I thought they would say, no way, it's not safe and it's not happening. Uh, but instead they prayed about it and they agreed that I could go and that experience I think was the launch point for my faith becoming a very personal experience where I was able to kind of branch out from my home church and from my family and begin to make my faith my own. When I was in Costa Rica I was experiencing things that I had not experienced in America um, I was in an environment that was not familiar to me. And so I really had to embrace my faith. I had to um, kind of walk it more alone than I was used to. And I think just through the experiences there, through seeing people who were such in extreme poverty, having such grateful hearts and such a passion for God really challenged me and convicted me. So I came back to America as a 14 year old completely transformed spiritually and emotionally. Um, it was not just a spiritual experience for me, it was a whole growth kind of experience for me. And I would say that was my launch point. Now, I would not say that from 14 until now has been easy sailing. I didn't just come back um, 
a 14 year old with her head completely on her shoulders, certain about every aspect of faith. Instead, it has been a journey. And you will probably get to hear more of her story uh, down the line as well. Uh, today, I want to tell you a really awesome story from the Old Testament. It is one of my favorite stories in the entire Bible. I, I think I like this story better than I like a lot of the more popular stories in the Old Testament. Like, I like this better than Noah and the Ark. I like it better than, than Joshua and the Wall. I like it better than uh, David and Goliath. I like it better than Jonah and the great fish. I like this story so much. And it's one that if you haven't been around church a lot, you may have never heard. But it's such an incredible story of faith and a journey of faith. And, and I believe it's going to be maybe timely for us today. So if you have your Bible, we're going to be in 2 Kings chapter 5. And I'm just going to kind of tell the story. We're going to start reading and we're just going to kind of go through it piece by piece. We're going to read about 18 and a half verses. 18 and a half is really important though. So if you have your Bible, 2 Kings chapter 5, it starts like this. Verse 1, Naaman. That's our guy. That's who we're going to be talking about today. Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria. In your translation, it may say of the Arameans. It's the same thing. Was a great man. And that means a mighty strong man with his master and in high favor. Because by him, the Lord had given victory to Syria. Victory over who, you may ask? Israel. That's a tough one. That's a different sermon for a different day. But he was a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. Ooh, now that's a big but right there, huge. And listen, here's the thing. If you had leprosy at this time, in this period of time, there was no cure. It had a 100% death rate. And they believed that this disease was highly contagious, right? And, and it would start, you would get little white patches of, uh, of skin, almost looked like a rash. And then uh, it would start on one part of your body, and then it would go all over your body. Then you would develop boils all over your body. They were nasty and gross. And then uh, you wouldn't be able to feel your extremities at all. And then your extremities would start falling off, and your face would become deformed. And it was one of the most painful diseases that you could ever possibly imagine having. And they thought it was a highly contagious disease with a 100% death rate. And so you did not ever want to get leprosy. This was the worst fate you could have. But we find Naaman, commander of the armies of Syria, in this place where he has leprosy. And it says this now, verse 2, the Syrians on one of their raids had carried off a little girl from the land of Israel, and she worked in the service of Naaman's wife. Verse 3, she said to her mistress, would that my Lord were with the prophet who is in Samaria he would cure him of his leprosy. Now, let's just make sure we understand what just happened here. Syria has been doing raids against Israel. They've been attacking Israel. They've been defeating Israel in war. They've been going in and they take people and they make them their servants in their homes. And so they took a little girl from Israel. She grew up in this house in Syria and now she is a servant in the house of Naaman. And she says, listen, I know you've got leprosy, but... If you would just go see this certain prophet, and the prophet that we're going to be talking about is a guy by the name of Elisha, one of the greatest prophets in the Old Testament. If you would just go see him, I bet he could cure you. Now, why would she do this? She's been taken from her home, and now she's helping the very guy that did it. It's such a cool story. And, and then uh, Naaman, verse 4, went in and told his lord, his king, thus and so spoke the girl from the land of Israel, told him the whole story. And then verse 5, and the king of Syria said, well, go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he went, taking with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 changes of clothing. Now, scholars would tell us that this is an enormous amount of money. This is 150 pounds of gold, 750 pounds of silver. And I guess the clothing does seem like a little bit of an odd add-in here. It's kind of like, hey... Here's $500,000 and some shirts, right? It, it doesn't seem to make sense, but, but actually most clothes at this period of time would have been all handmade. And, and scholars tell us that this would have been party clothing, 10 things of party clothing, uh, which most people would never own even one in their entire lifetime. 
And so uh, if he wants it, Elisha is about to get some really good clothing, right? Some bling. He is about to be one of the most fashionable people in all of Israel if he wants it. And so verse six, he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which read, when this letter reaches you, know that I have sent to you Naaman, my servant, that you may cure him of his leprosy. Verse seven, and when the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, am I God to kill and make alive that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? Only consider and see how he is seeking a quarrel with me. In other words, Syria has been attacking us, maybe even for years at this point. They've been raiding our lands. They've been defeating us in war. And he sends his top general, his top leader to me and says, will you please cure him of his leprosy? Does that make sense to anybody else? <laughs> that, that's a crazy thing. And then it goes on. But when Elisha, verse eight, but when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent to the king saying, why have you torn your clothes? Let him come now to me that he may know there is a prophet in Israel. And what Elisha is saying is, I don't want him to come and know me. I want him to know that there's a God in Israel. See, Elisha saw something that the king couldn't see. Elisha saw something that Naaman couldn't see. Elisha saw a purpose in his leprosy. And the purpose was that Naaman, through this terrible disease, might actually come to know God, might actually come to believe that there is a God in Israel who would offer a relationship with him. Elisha saw something bigger than anybody else could have seen in this moment. And so verse nine, so Naaman came with his horses and chariots and stood at the door of Elisha's house. Now, quick time out here. Could you imagine being on the Israel countryside because uh, Elisha lived a long way away from where the king was, right? Could you imagine being on that Hebrew countryside and seeing this big cavalcade of, of chariots and horses come running through, knowing what Syria has been doing to your country, right? It would have been one of those hide your kids, hide your wife, hide your husband kind of moments, right? Everybody get out of here. They're coming to get us. But he comes and he just kind of knocks on Elisha's door and he's waiting there. And then Elisha, verse 10, I love this. Elisha sent a messenger out to him. Wait a second. This guy traveled miles and miles and miles. And then you told him to come to your house. And then you send out a messenger to him. That's, that's insane. It's like you're too busy to even go out and meet with the guy that you asked to come over. That would be like the, a foreign leader coming to my house, expecting me to, to do something for them. And, and they roll up with this huge line of escalades and, and they stand at my front door and knock and I send out my son and they say, well, yeah, my dad, you know, he's a little bit busy right now, um, but he told me to give you these instructions. And then they look inside and they see me just sitting on the couch watching TV. That's kind of the extent of what's happening right here. And so Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, go and wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh will be restored and you shall be clean. Clear directions, clear instructions what to do. But Naaman was angry and went away saying, behold, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call upon the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. Like in other words, I thought there would be this fancy miracle where Elisha would just come out and do what I wanted him to do and that God would take care of it so that I could go back to attacking Israel. That's what I thought would happen. How dare he just tell me what to do? Verse 12, are not Avana and far far, the, the, far, far the rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? They were these mighty rushing rivers. Could I not wash in them and be clean? The Jordan River is like this little muddy river. It's small, only, only about 10 or 15 feet wide. And it's 15 miles the other way. Why do I have to do this? And then it says, he turned away and went away in a rage. He's mad. He's angry. In his mind, here's what he's thinking is going to happen. Sure, Elisha wants me to go down to that muddy river away from my town, away from my land. And he wants me to get in there and wash and then nothing's going to happen. But instead, 10,000 Israelites are going to be laughing on the banks of the Jordan River and they're going to be able to tell people forever about the time that that crazy general Naaman came down and washed in the river in Israel. And they're going to make fun of me and they're going to attack me. 
But his servants came near, verse 13. His servants came near and said to him, My father, it, it is a great word that the prophet has spoken to you. Will you not do it? Has he actually said to you, wash and be clean? In other words, it's like, you know, if he had asked you to do any number of things, you probably would have just done it already. Like, just, will you not just go give it a try? And so, verse 14, he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Then, verse 15, he returned to the man of God, he and all his company, and he came and stood before him and said, now quick time out right here. What would you say in this moment? What do you say to the guy who just healed you of a disease that would have killed you? Do you say, thank you? Do you say, hey, you, I owe you my life. Do you say, here's some of that money I'm going to give you. What, what do you say to him? This is what he did say. Behold. I know that there is no God in all the earth, but in Israel. No, no mention of, hey, you did this for me, thank you. No, no even mention of the leprosy. Instead, all he mentions is that there's now a God in Israel, and I believe it. Now, what was Elisha's big goal in all of this? That Naaman know that there's God. That Naaman come to know God on a personal level. See, Naaman came seeking a cure for leprosy, but Elisha recognized that there was something bigger at play here. Elisha offered him a God, a God that could be his father, a God that could ultimately be his savior. And then it says this, and he urged him, and, and, and he said, so accept now a present from your servant. But he said, as the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will receive none. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. And so what you have here is a, a really expensive gift being offered by someone to essentially a pastor. And the pastor says, no, I just want you to know that that will not happen around here. OK, we're, we're just so we're on the same page. But you see, this was actually a really important part of the story because uh, he came at the beginning with all this money and all this stuff, thinking that maybe his miracle could be bought thinking that maybe um, uh, if he paid the prophet enough money that the prophet would do what God want, what, what, what Naaman wanted him to do and heal his leprosy, but this couldn't be bought. And so Elisha couldn't have everybody in the, the whole Israel thinking that you could buy these types of things because that's not the way that God worked. So he refused. Then verse 17, then Naaman said, if not, please let there be given to your servant two mule loads of earth. For from now on, your servant will not offer burnt offering or sacrifice to any God but the Lord. And the reason that maybe he did that, as scholars say, is because he was going to take that, spread the dirt on the ground wherever he was, and that was where he was going to offer his sacrifice to his new God. Verse 13, In this matter, may the Lord pardon your servant. When my master goes into the house of Ramon to worship there, leaning on my arm, and I bow myself in the house of Ramon, when I bow myself in the house of Ramon, the house of the Lord pardon your servant in this matter. That's weird. It's like, okay, I'm going to worship your God, but when I go and worship this other God too, I want you to make sure that God's okay with me. Like, I know that yours is really the only God. It's kind of like I'm going to be doing just this other thing because everybody expects me to, but make sure that God's okay with me. And then what Elisha says next, he says, go in peace. I find this story so fascinating because what you see happen in this story is that Naaman, he has to take one step of faith each time. As the story progresses, it's like one small act of obedience, one step of faith, and it gets him closer. One step of faith, and it gets him closer. Another step of faith, and it gets him closer. It's kind of like, go to Israel. That's one step of faith. Go before the king, that's a step of faith. Go before Elisha, that's another step of faith. Go and dip into the river, that's another step of faith. What step of faith? What step of obedience? What's your next step? What does God have for you? What, what does that next step of obedience look like in your life? Maybe for you it's, it's, it's saying, you know what, I want to connect and regularly be a part of church. I, I'm going to, to, to go all in. You know, I've kind of just been on the fringes. 
I, I kind of maybe show up when I feel like it or when I when it's convenient for me. But the reality is, is that I recognize that I need to be all in. Maybe that's your next step of faith. Maybe for you, it's it's that you need to put God first in your marriage, in the way that you parent. Maybe that's your next step of faith. Maybe for you, it's in the way that you do business. You need to put God first. That's your next step of faith. Maybe for you, it's financial. You need to trust God with your money and begin being generous to people around you. Maybe that's your next step of faith. But what is your next step of obedience? Here's what I want to encourage you today. From the story of Naaman, this incredible Old Testament story, I want to encourage you to take that next step of obedience. Whatever it looks like, don't say no to it. And maybe you've been saying no for a long time. This is the day. This is the moment that you can say yes. I'm going to follow through. God, whatever that next step of faith is for me, I say yes to you and to it. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for your word. And I love this story. It's a great reminder about our faith and obedience to you. God, I pray that you would help us to take that next step of faith. I don't know what that looks like for everybody. Maybe it means more devotion in our prayer life. Maybe it means more trust at home. Maybe it means more devotion and, and focus at our work, whatever it may be. Maybe it means that, that we begin sharing our faith outwardly with our neighbors, with our family, with our friends. Whatever that next step of faith is, God, I pray that you would give us the boldness and the strength to do it. And that we would be able to look back on this day and say, that was, the, that was the moment that everything changed for me. That was the moment that that one thing, that one small step of faith made all the difference in my life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now we're going to be, we're going to be launching into a brand new series next week. Most likely as we regather here. And it'll continue to be online as well. You know what? One thing that I have been... Um, noticing that people have been saying is I can't wait for things to get back to normal. I can't wait for things to get back to the way that they were. I want us to be challenged on that. So we're going to start a new series. Check this video out then I'll tell you a little bit about it. challenge you to a new normal in your life. We're going to challenge you to put on habits that that transform, that change your normal. Don't just think about going back to the old ways, to the old normal, to the way that things used to be. What if, what if God wants to do something new in you? Because if I know anything from scripture, it's that God loves new, new. Go through scripture and see how many times he talks about the old being made new. And so listen, we are going to launch into this series next week and we are going to give us, challenge us with some habits that will create a new normal in you. Not a new normal in our culture, not a new normal in our world. We're not worried about that so much. We want to create a new normal in you. And I believe God wants to do a great work in you. So we will see you guys next Sunday. If you feel comfortable and safe, we're going to have the measures in place here where we are going to gather in person. If you want to continue to join us online, 1045 next Sunday morning, we will be live on Facebook. Shortly after that, we'll have it on our YouTube and our website. But make sure you join with us next week. told you my story you would hear hope they wouldn't let go and if I told you my story you would hear love but never gave up and if I told you my story
wasn't mine If I should speak Then let it be Of the grace that is greater Than all my sin Of when justice was served And when mercy wins Of the kindness of Jesus The trust